All right, folks, your crap pack in the weight room. Price for success, no pain, no gain. To achieve, you have to believe, and they do that at Tommy Yankello's world-class boxing. Still to come, Greg, Tommy, and I will once again look at the Manny Pacquiao, Timothy Bradley fight just days away at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas and on Showtime pay-per-view, courtesy of HBO. But we have a lot to get to on our Thursday night sports wrap, and we begin with the Masters. Jordan Speed, six under 66. But what happened to Ernie Owens on hole number one? <laughs> well, I don't know that I've ever six putted a green. Apparently the re early reports were a seven, but now they've, they've said it's only a nine stroke hole. Uh, tough day for the kid though. But still he shot 80. I mean, if, if I could shoot 80 at Augusta, I'd be the happiest guy in the country. And then there's Jason Day, who really had the hot hand coming into the Masters. 31, he blazed the first nine, and then he tumbled to where now he's at even par. Yeah, he got to 500, was within one stroke of the lead, and then the wheels just really came off for, for Jason Day. And that's unusual for him because the number one golfer in the world, a guy who you expect, once you get the 500, you're on a roll like that. It's very unusual to go completely brain dead. Then two shots off the lead. How about Danny Lee? I enjoyed watching his play. ESPN, Jim Nance on the call. He, of course, will be there in the final two days with CBS. CBS crew is uh, the first two days with ESPN. Let's talk about Danny Lee, 400. Yeah, it, it, what a nice day for a guy, not really one of those guys who was in the odds makers' favorites to be the guy that they could get there, but you know, that golf course that you're like, how about the pristine conditions of that? It, it's, it, it almost looks like the, it's so well so manicured, it's not even real. Tell you, when I was watching Steve Lowry during one of his amazing uh, drives today, the wind was incredible. And not just what he did off the tee, but so many others, like people like Paul Casey and Ian Poulter and Justin Rose, they're all the three under. They were all driving the ball spectacularly today with some really windy conditions. Yeah, and it's interesting because there are some places on that golf course that they are pretty tight, and you've got some windows that you've got to get fit balls through, but yet the holes, they lengthen the course, so you can't just try to manipulate balls through. You've got to really rip it and get it out there. So these guys are really great. Uh, my man Ricky Fowler, a little tough day. He's an eight right now, that's an eight plus, but it's okay. Um, uh, Rory McIlroy going for the career grand slam and to get into that category of 25 or mid 20s, uh, such prestigious names, lots of folks in there, including Tiger and Jack, Gary Player, Gene Saracen, Ben Hogan, so I wish him the best of luck. But overall, I think it was a good day. It was, it was a fantastic day. And, uh, one of those things that you go home and, and now you can watch what we DVR'd earlier, so we missed a little bit in preparation here, so we got a little bit to catch up on. But uh, you, you talk about those career grand slams, it's amazing that, that when McElroy has that chance to join. The only five guys in the history of the game have won career grand slams, let alone a grand slam in any one year. It's pretty, pretty elite crowd. It is an elite crowd. Okay, we move on to the Pittsburgh Pirates, 3 0. Ladies and gentlemen, just some early notes on the Pirates. Francisco Liriano strikes out 10 on opening day. The last one to do that, the great Bob Gibson in 1967. What about Francisco Liriano? Well, look at him. Analyze his pitch count that day. He threw 91 pitches. He threw 50 strikes. He almost threw just as many balls as he did strikes. He's a guy that works hard. He keeps battling. He never gives in on him at bat. Always working very hard, looking for corners, looking to pick something up, trying to get swings and misses. He pitched great, but one, the Casio is the story of the first series. You know, I didn't realize about, realize about the Casio. He gets drafted by Colorado, takes a line drive, thanks to the great sports medicine docs once again making a wrong or right. They put a couple of screws, metal plates in his neck. He struggles a little bit, gets traded to the Dodgers, didn't work out, bullpen, gets an opportunity with the Pirates in the Amazing Race series. This guy just was lights out 15 innings, scoreless 24 strikeouts in the spring, and then last night he just picked up where he left off. Now they Frankenstein him. I mean, you get those these high quality televisions now, you get that shot from center field, you can see the, the, the bolt that goes right back down to the through his spine. Amazing story. What a what an outing he had. Really strong performance. You being an agent, Greg Dayo's Vantage Management Group, one of the best, and of course sports attorney, you can hear him every Sunday on the Coos Market Black and Gold Sunday show. The Nutting family and uh, the entire crew, Frank Coonley, Neil Huntington, great job and extension for Gregory Polanco, 35 mil over five. That's a great deal for everyone involved. It sure looks like a great deal for the organization as opposed to the player. I mean, 
mean, we, we talked earlier, we, I, I kind of had him as my little pick to be a, a guy in the running for the MVP this year because I really think he's got that much upside. If he wins an MVP in these first few years, that agent better run for his life because Gregory Colombo is going to want to kill this guy. If Max is out at $60 million over seven years, it, it's, that's not enough money. That's a steal for the Pirates. Anybody wants to sign me to that deal, I'm ready right now. <laughs> All right, listen, let's talk about the Pens. They're in action tonight at Washington, but it's that second spot Metropolitan Division opponents they are fighting against the Rangers and the Islanders. Those two teams locking horns tonight. Uh, both the Islanders and the Rangers, if the Pens get either one, the good news is their top defensemen are out. And uh, Lenquist, the Pens have had ability to figure him out with the Rangers, and hopefully Marc-Andre Fleur will be back after the concussion. But heading into the postseason, I love the Penguins play. I know Kenny Malkin's gone, but Sidney Crosby has been all just on the money of late. I like their chances against either one, but if you would have your pick, who would it be? Islanders. Uh, you know, I, I, I would re much prefer for the Penguins' sake to, to be playing the Islanders. It's just a better matchup than the Penguins. The, the speed, speed matchup with the Rangers is, is I, I believe, a difficult factor for the Penguins, whereas the Penguins can definitely outflank the Islanders in that round. All right, now we move on to the NFL, the draft coming up, and he will be on the air with me on Rock Ride Tuesday night, the week of the draft, to break it all down. That's April 26th at 9 o'clock. Mel Kuyper, I love you, Mel. There's no one that does it better. For my money, he's the only one that I listen to, and that's the truth. And I did a little Google on him today, and he is saying that the Steelers are going to go after, no, not Eli Apple, the cornerback out of Houston, William Jackson III, who's got the size, the speed, and the strength in the Steelers could use. Well, Rob, the one thing that Mel doesn't have on that little big blurb that he had is, in recent years, the Steelers have only drafted players that they have visited. Teams are only allowed to visit 30 players to bring them in. Right. They have not visited either of the players that you just mentioned. They have visited five defensive backs so far. Uh, and generally speaking, that's usually going to be the way that the Steelers go. Now, always there's that little bit of uh, subterfuge that you try to throw people off and maybe don't get them to, don't, don't get other teams to think you're going to go after one of those players. But history has shown it's going to be somebody that they have brought in as a visitor. But the Kuiperism, that's right, it's always out there. Be honest with me, does anybody do it better? Come on. No, and I really like Mel. Mel's been doing it for a long time. He gets a lot of flack from the new guy, the newbie on ESPN, Todd McShay, who kind of tries to upstage Mel a lot, but I'm, I'm, I'm a Kuiper fan. I like him. Listen, Todd, you're good, but center stage will always go to Mel Kuiper. Good stuff. Okay, now here's what Mel is saying as far as the first three. You got Tennessee, um, Tinsel, the uh, offensive tackle out of Ole Miss, uh, and also Cleveland, I love this at number two, Carson Wentz, the quarterback, North Dakota State, and then uh, it is a Ramsey defensive back um, from Florida State at number three, and that is for the Chargers. How do you like that? I don't like the, the Cleveland pick, especially because of the R.J. RG Griffin move that just happened this week. So I think you're more likely to see the Kim, Robert Kim D.J. kid from Ole Miss that fell out of the window but at, at a party earlier in the season. He's okay, though. Yeah, he's fine. He, he must be fine. He fell two stories, and then he just bounced back up. Uh, I think that's more likely to be the type of player that Cleveland goes after if they don't trade out of it. They need a all right, and uh, the Steelers announced today on KDK TV2. Bob Pompey does a great job. Their preseason lineup will be Detroit, Philly, and then at New Orleans and at Carolina. Any more thoughts about the Steelers in the draft before you move on? Uh, more thoughts about the Steelers. A lot of people are talking now there's going to be a wide receiver in that mix. I like when the Steelers draft an impact player, an offensive guy that makes a splash, a big pass rusher, as opposed to somebody that we have to wait three or four years to develop an offensive line or something like that. Hopefully it will be a splash player, not somebody that we have to wait to see. And back to Wentz, the reason you, if you're a RG3 fan, which I am, would not want to see that, because if that happens and he's going to be the guy for the quarterback and waiting, he's never going to get the opportunity to feel like he's the guy, such what happened to him with Kirk Cousins in Washington. And I don't really think that would be fair to him. And I know it's a business, but I still think he's young enough to be a franchise player. I'm with you. I really liked him when he first was having those years at, at the Redskins and then he got with the technology that he's been able to redevelop that need, look for big things out of RG3. All right, Pitt, hell Pitt, in spring practice, the Blue Bowl game, April 16th. You've got the blue team, Larry Fitzgerald, great player. And, of course, the gold team, Aaron Donaldson, a great player. 
Um, you've got uh, Conklin, the defensive coordinator, a coach, as is the offensive uh, coordinator, Jim Chaney. Pat Narduzzi says it's going to be vanilla, doesn't want to show YSU or Air, uh, Art, um, uh, Akron anything, but team uh, unity, he likes what he sees. This linebacker, Elijah Zeiss, liking what he's seen. Tell me about it. Oh, our buddy from the fan, Paul Zeiss's son. Uh, See, Paul, uh, you know I took care of you. Yeah. <laughs> Elijah's a really good young player. I thought he showed a lot of flash last year at the wide receiver position. I assume that he's bulked up a little bit to play the linebacker spot. The kid's a really good athlete, and I'm looking for some really interesting and intriguing things out of that new alignment for him. All right, Nate Peterman has been a good mentor to the younger quarterbacks, and I like when that happens. You always like when a player is willing to help somebody else develop. It shows confidence in him to not say, hey, I'm not going to help you because you could someday take my job. Uh, and I don't think Peterman has to worry about that. I hope he does develop a, 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 to the next level uh, as this year in, uh, moves along. All right, last thing, offensive line coach John Peterson talking about um, Bookster, Alex Bookster, moving to center. And, and I got one other thing about the offensive line. What do you think about that? Hey, it's a neat position right now because they lost Alex Officer, uh, who's a really highly projected player down the road. I uh, had an ankle situation from the military bowl and then did it in the offseason. So there's, a, there's kind of a, we don't want to have to do this, but now we have to do it. I really uh, at right guard, John Guy. They like what they see out of him too. Big guy, lots of talent, quick feet. Yeah, it, athletic, which which they like in with the inside guys with good feet that can can really move around and, and do those types of things. All right, you know, Pitt athletics all season. When it comes to football and basketball, 93-7 the fan, as are the Pirates. We're going to take a bit of a break, and uh, then we're going to talk boxing because it's Manny Pacquiao and it's Tim Bradley, the rubber match, coming up on Saturday night, Showtime, pay-per-view, courtesy of HBO. The great Tommy Yankella working with his fighters here in Ambridge. He'll join us next.